want to meet a man who can help me. Professor Irving Kirsch devised his own experiment to see whether merely believing you're having something could have the same effect as actually having it. He showed that this could significantly affect people's coordination skills. So how did you design this experiment that was going to show that what people believed could affect their bodies? Well, the first thing we wanted to find is something that happens in everyday life. And one of the things that people do is they drink coffee and tea that has caffeine in it. People report all kinds of effects. They get jittery, they are able to concentrate better, they become more alert. And some of these effects are clearly effects of, of caffeine, but I wondered, perhaps some of them are also effects of thinking that you've taken caffeine, thinking that you've had a caffeinated beverage. So what would happen to people's ability to respond quickly, to concentrate, if we gave them decaffeinated coffee without them being aware of it? The idea was to test whether decaffeinated coffee would have the same effect on people's coordination as real caffeine. The performance would be assessed before and after they'd been given the caffeine-free drink. So when a volunteer turned up to do the trial, what would they experience? First thing that we did was to give people some tests of cognitive abilities and motor skills. And then what? We asked people then uh, what they thought would happen to their ability to do these tests. So it's kind of looking at their expectation of what the coffee's going to do. That's exactly what it is. It was then time to bring on what looked like coffee and to make sure no one could tell the difference. We went through the, the whole ritual of brewing the coffee. We had a recognized brand of regular coffee, although what was really in, in it that they didn't know was decaffeinated coffee, placebo coffee, if you will. We had just emptied out the bag of coffee and put in decaffeinated coffee. And, and presumably you'd use coffee with a great aroma, so it was completely convincing. That's really what they were getting. It was very important to be completely convincing. We brewed the coffee, poured them a cup, had them drink it. Then we waited for a period of time, about 15 minutes, to let the coffee go through their system, let the caffeine, which didn't exist, take effect. And then we remeasured their performance on these various tasks. The activities tested the volunteers' coordination. It included the ability to concentrate and remember s strings of numbers, to follow with their hand a, a moving target, the ability to react very quickly when a particular stimulus would be shown. So a kind of a, a concentration test, an accuracy test and a speed test. That's right. But would it work? Would drinking something with absolutely no caffeine really have the same effect as drinking the real thing? The answer was yes. In more technical terms, there was a correlation, a significant correlation, between what people believe the effects of coffee would be and what the effects of unknowingly decaffeinated coffee was on their behaviour. So just believing that something's going to make you better can make you better regardless of whether you actually have any of the thing. That's exactly what our data suggest. The evidence was certainly there, and I couldn't argue with it. This experiment confirms that if you're told that something will happen, and you really believe it will, that can bring about changes in the body. And it seems to work for an everyday example, like caffeine but also for a long-term chronic condition like asthma. But what about something more dramatic? Here in Texas, I think I'm going to get the evidence I'm after. Proof of the huge power of the placebo. Houston seems to me like a pretty ordinary American city with its cluster of shiny high-rises. But something extraordinary has happened here. And if you thought you knew anything about healing, I think you're in for a shock. The idea was to treat people in great pain. Volunteers with severe knee arthritis were gathered from around the state 
and divided into groups. Two groups would have a surgical procedure. The third would be given a placebo, fake surgery. They'd have a general anaesthetic, be opened up, but wouldn't have any real procedure. They would merely think they had. I had to meet the surgeon. It's very important uh, for the patients not to know which treatment that they have. And they're always trying to look for clues. You know, they're always trying to get you to tell them. And uh, the best way to avoid that, of course, is to not know as a doctor until the last minute which treatment they're going to have. Each patient would receive a general anaesthetic, but only two groups would have an actual procedure. Not even the surgical staff knew who was in each group until they were in the theater. I would open the envelope in the room and I would read it, but I wouldn't announce it out loud. And then I would show it to the nurses who were working with me and I would show it to the anesthesiologist and nobody would ever say which of the three treatments was revealed in the envelope. We had a very elaborate ruse, if you will. I would play a videotape on the TV of a real surgery. And while I was watching the TV, I would ask for instruments and pass things back and forth and carry on conversation as if it was what I would really have done if what was happening on the TV screen was actually going on during that surgery. So we would have water splashing, we would have instruments clanking, and we would do this for the same amount of time that the actual surgery on the videotape took place so that uh, a patient and their family couldn't watch the clock and say, oh, we were only in the operating room for 10 minutes, so it must have been a pretend surgery. All this acting felt a bit weird to a doctor trained in standard surgical procedures. In the big picture, always in the back of my mind, I was thinking, good gosh, uh, here's a patient who we're pretending to do surgery on. We're not really doing surgery. And, you know, I, I'm a, a, a physician and a healer after all. And is this kind of really, you know, the right thing to do? Or what have I gotten myself into? It took two years for the study to be completed. Finally, it was time for Dr. Mosley to hear the truth from the patients themselves. I would say, uh, if you think that the surgery helped your knee, I want you to give me a thumbs up. If you think the surgery didn't help your knee, I want you to give me a thumbs down. And if you're not sure or you're, you're kind of neutral, just hold your hand flat. I mean, twist your knee the verdict? Kind of Success tears. for every group, uh, fake or genuine. Sham surgery had worked. Case, the patients who had it were astonished. The response ranged from You've got to be kidding me, I can't believe it, bewilderment, there must be a mistake, because they all felt so strongly that something had happened to change what was going on inside their knee. During your training, what were you taught about the placebo effect? Nothing. I had no clue. I went from being a skeptic to a believer. I realized that we were really onto something. There are clearly cases where we do surgeries and it's uh, as much or more the patient's feeling about the surgery that influences the result as the actual surgery itself. <laughs>